Okay. So um, we're going to really talk today about how to take better pictures with our phone and how to compose better photos and how to use these photos to our advantage. Um, you know, we all are here for different reasons. Maybe we're farmers who are trying to get more followers on Instagram or we're market managers who just want to be able to take better photos for our publicity um, opportunities. So again, thank you so much for joining. Um, disclaimer, I would say most of these pictures that you're going to see are from my phone. I have an iPhone. Um, of course, I have many other cameras, but it seems for some reason the iPhone is the one I use because it's always in my back pocket. So we're all going to um, get to know our cell phone cameras a little bit better, and we're also going to learn some composition basics. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what kind of camera you have. People just see how you compose that shot. So I'm going to just give you a couple tricks um, to put in your pocket um, next time you're taking photos. So I always tell my students, we're all just filling a rectangle, right? I mean, technically, you're filling a square, too, if you want to crop it. For it used to be Instagram, you can only do a square, but... Um, it's always been a rectangle, you know, back in the day in early ages of photography, we were just filling a rectangle. Okay, so no matter what phone or camera you have, we're going to learn today how to fill that rectangle. And I know everyone has a different phone and I'm going to do my best to keep it as generic as possible. This is not a iPhone lesson. This is not a, I don't even know the other kinds, a <laughs> Samsung lesson or whatever. This is just a filling a rectangle lesson. So we're gonna start with some camera basics. And I always tell my students, some of these things may seem really silly that I'm even saying them, like, duh, I already know that, but maybe someone doesn't know that. So I'm gonna start at the beginning and we're gonna kind of build up together. So if you're still familiar, unfamiliar with your specific phone functions, I do encourage you to look up your phone model. Um, online, there are hundreds of YouTube videos just for your phone. Right. So if I say when you do this with your phone and you look at your phone and it doesn't really have that option, it might have that option. It's just it's slightly different. So after this presentation, if you feel like, gosh, I still have questions about my Galaxy, whatever, look that phone up online and also look up on YouTube because people literally make a living making videos about specific phones. OK. So we all take pictures with our phones, but after today, hopefully you'll start taking great photos. So again, this sounds really simple, but the first thing you want to do is clean your lens. Okay. I, my phone was like super fogged up the other day and I tried to take a picture and it looked like I was underwater and I had moisture in my case. Right. So the first thing you want to do is clean your lens. It will make your images clearer and sharper. And even if you take really good care of your phone, you still get thumbprints on it or smudges or you're like me and you have a toddler and who knows where your phone is. Um, just make sure that that outer lens is clean. And if it seems like it's still cloudy, if there's something wrong, take off your case and clean the inside as well. And you can use, you know, uh, you can use your shirt, but also use like a microfiber cloth. Find your focus. This is something that I think it's so easy to just take your phone and point it at something and take the photo, but you can make your photo sharper by finding your focus first. So you have your camera up, your phone up, and you're looking at something, tap the screen where you want to set the focus, okay? On an iPhone, a yellow square will appear where the main focus will be. So you can see here on this flower, I tap in the middle. The camera might think you want to focus on that vase, but really you wanna focus on that flower. And you might be surprised, it seems so simple, but it really will make your images sharper. Your camera wants to take a photo, just help it along a little bit by really getting that focus sharper. Um, after you find your focus, you know, find your focus, compose, and then take your photo. Now, when you touch your screen, it also changes how that image is exposed, right? So these two examples, if I touch the, sky if i focus on the sky the camera says oh you want to expose the sky i'll do that for you or you can touch on the green foliage there and it, the camera will say oh you want to expose here now you can see you can't really have everything exposed with this scene and i'll give you a tip later on how to change that but just know that when you touch your screen to focus your exposure might change along with it okay so the camera is trying its best to get a good photo for you um you might find when you're taking a photo, tap different areas of the scene and one exposure might look better to you than the other. So how do we adjust our brightness? 
Okay, so you tap your screen to find your focus. You can also tap your screen to control your exposure. So you hold your finger down on the screen. And again, this is an iPhone, but it's pretty similar on most phones. Hold down your finger on the screen and the sun icon shows up. And then you just drag it up and down. Okay, so you can exchange that. You can always change your exposure later in editing software, but why not take a good photo the first time around, right? So hold down your finger and you kind of slide it up to be brighter, slide it down to be darker. So here's some examples. Um, the picture on the left, we we'll kind of slide it down. Maybe you want to brighten it up a little bit. Maybe you're at the farmer's market and you just want it to, it's underneath of a tent and you just want it a little bit brighter. This is how you could kind of help it along, okay? Here's another example. You know, I always tell my students, it's like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? One's too bright, one's too dark, but one of them is perfect. Okay, a well exposed photo is going to have great color. It's going to have good detail. You're going to have detail in your highlights, your shadows, and your midtones. Steady your shot. Cell phones are pretty sensitive to movement. A common cause of blurry photos often is camera shake. This is also common in low lighting situations. Um, you know, I definitely kind of if I'm worried about my photo being shaky, I might set my camera up on something. Um, you can always make a tripod. If you don't have one, you can, you know, set it up against a book or set it up against something to keep it steady. You can set your timer. If you're really worried about camera shake, why not set your camera up, set the timer, then your camera is completely steady. Um, you can also um, hold your breath. I know photographers who do that. You can put your arms really close to your body and, you know, really try to keep that steady. Most Newer cameras have kind of a um, image stabilizing system in them and, you know, some do, some don't, but um, test your handshake and see how you do. If you feel like your images are not as sharp as you want them to be, camera shake could be the culprit. Use natural light when possible. So we're going to talk a lot about light today because light is literally the essence of photography is capturing light. Um, it's one of the most important factors in any photo. Again, no matter the camera that you have, light is going to be a big part of the success of your image. If you can make use of available natural light, then you don't have to resort to that phone, that built-in flash, which can be kind of harsh. Um, if you're lucky like me and you have a, a big barn to shoot in, um, if you look at my Instagram, most of my photos are, you know, this kind of even light, evenly distributed light. I take most of my photos in my barn, right? Not outside at noon on a harsh day. So this is just taken on our um, market, or I should say harvest table in the barn. Um, use grid lines to balance your shot. And we'll talk a little bit later about rule of thirds, but this helps some people. I have it on my phone. Um, it kind of breaks your screen into three vertical um, columns and three horizontal columns. And I have here on the screen, you know, how you can do it in your iPhone or your Galaxy. It's usually in your settings under photos and camera, and you can do switch grid on. The grid isn't there on your image. It's just a way to kind of help you straighten things out, help you kind of balance things, help you say, wow, my horizon looks like there's been an earthquake and everything's about to fall out of the picture. You know, it just helps you kind of line things up. This is also useful for food photography and still life photography, especially when you need to shoot from above. If you look in the image here, there's some crosshairs that show up on the iPhone. Um, and when the crosshairs are lined up, like the image on the right, that means that you are centered and it's going to be proportional. So the image on the left, you can see there's, you know, it's not quite equal. So think about that crosshair in the middle is the center of your photograph. You get those crosshairs lined up, it's going to look a lot better. Uh, know the modes on your camera. Again, everyone's going to have different modes, but the basic modes are, of course, you got your photo, your basic photo. You have a square, which is going to crop it. Um, I always say shoot larger if you can. You can always crop it to square later. If you're like me and you're just taking pictures for Instagram, it's not like you're trying to sell them, you know, as giant prints, um, you know, at an art show or something. Um, but, you know, the more information you have on the photo, the better. You can always crop it later. But if you'd like to shoot in the square, Go ahead, shoot in the square. There's also a panorama option and the portrait mode, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, the portrait mode is available on some phones and it's becoming more popular. It's um, technology that uses two lenses and it kind of gives that um, appearance of as if you were using, say, an SLR and opening up your aperture and allowing a shallower depth of field. So the image on the left, you can see that the person is in focus, but the background is out of focus. And this is typically how we think about 
portrait photos, right? The person's in focus and the background is kind of out of focus. And it gives you this way to isolate your subject matter and kind of take away a busy background, if you will. Um, on my portrait setting on my phone, um, it automatically does that. So if you feel like it's not working, take a step back, all of a sudden it'll blur out for you. You can see it um, in real time. So why would we use this setting? Um, it can create the effect of a shallow depth of field and blur out the background. So here I'm taking a picture of these little seedlings and you know, it just kind of looks professional, right? It's such an easy way to kind of step up your photography, even though you're using a cell phone. Um, Cause this is something, you know, it's kind of the magic of photography. Our eyes don't see this, but cameras see that. Cameras can say, okay, I'm gonna isolate this thing in the front and kind of let it blur out in the background. So this technique works best from a certain distance, right? So the camera will ask you to back up or get closer if it's not ideal. Like my phone will literally be like, no, you're doing it wrong. So if it's not working, listen to what the camera's saying. If it's telling you to get closer, if it's telling you to step back or whatever, do that and you'll see it change. Um, also, you wanna think about the subject matter. Make sure your subject matter has a foreground and a background. So like this picture of jelly jars, right? So the foreground is in focus and we slowly go out of focus towards the back. If it doesn't have a background to blur out, like if there's not a distance between the foreground and the background, then that effect isn't really gonna work. If that makes sense. If you're just shooting your friend standing up against a wall in Asheville, is there much distance between that person and the wall? No, but say you took a picture of that same friend standing in an alleyway and here's your friend and then the alley kind of goes behind them, right? That now gives us a sense of distance and therefore the camera can blur that distance out. Again, if it's not working, listen to what your phone is saying. So HDR is another option in your phone. Uh, most will have it. Um, it creates evenly lit images of high contrast scenes. So what am I talking about? A high contrast scene is an, a scene that has both dark and bright areas. So say this picture of a landscape and it has a washed out sky, but it has a dark foreground. So the human eye will look at this scene and be like, oh, it's an overcast sky and here's this foreground. But a camera can't do that. A camera can't see that whole range. Um, so the camera kind of struggles to capture detail in both shadows and highlights at the same time. So you kind of have to pick or choose, right? And this is where that tapping your screen to find your exposure comes in handy. Because say I tap the picture on the left, I can tap on that um, the sunset and the camera will darken Right, our image will darken and it's saying, oh, you want to expose the sky, but you can kind of see how the foreground gets too dark. Well, I really want to expose the foreground and I tap on that um, old boat and all of a sudden the sky gets washed out, right? So if you don't have HDR, you kind of have to pick which one you think is what you want. And that's going to be you kind of clicking on that image where you want to set that exposure, right? So if our highlights are properly exposed and the shadows will appear too dark or the shadows are properly exposed and the highlights are going to be washed out. How can we fix this? Um, if you have the option of HDR, oftentimes it's up on top of your phone near your flash options. HDR means high dynamic range. And th that idea is that you are telling the camera, no, I want exposure in my bright areas and I want exposure in my shadow areas. Okay. So it kind of is tricking the camera and it starts to make kind of two exposures on top of each other. And the, um, result would be the picture on the on the right here where the foreground is exposed and now the sky is exposed okay so if you don't have hdr you kind of have to pick or choose but if you do have hdr i encourage you to try it you don't need to have it on all the time um but if you have a scene that has bright and dark and you're finding that one is washed out this is magical and will help you with that um, you can always edit images in your phone. You don't have to have an expensive program like Photoshop to edit um, your images. There are many photo editing apps that you can add to your phone. There's like Snapseed, Adobe Photo Express, Visco, which I really like. But there's a lot of basic options right in your phone. So you can get these apps, but know that you should have some sort of editing in your camera. So you can add filters, tweak colors, straighten images, etc. So explore your phone's editing capabilities this week. That's your kind of homework. It's like, what do I have on my phone? Did I even know this existed? So you can 
basic things you can do on your phone. You can change the exposure, even beyond tapping on the screen and changing the exposure, like while you're taking the image, you can, you know, kind of tweak it later. Brilliance, highlights, again, those are the bright parts of your image or the shadows, which are the dark parts of your image. You can adjust the contrast, the brightness, how dark the black point is, saturation, which is like how vivid your colors are, your vibrance, how warm something is. You know, everything looks nice warmer. So if something seems a little cool, you can just bump up the warmth on it. Um, noise has to do with kind of graininess of an image, all those things. You can crop it, so on and so forth. So I encourage you to, you know, if this is the if this is the camera that you're using for whatever your reasoning is, just get to know it better a little bit this week and take an image and go into your editing and just tweak it if you can. So you can see at the bottom here, I have this like these three circles and that opens up all of these kind of editing options. And my advice is always slow down. Take the time to compose your image. You can take the time to check the whole image, right? Maybe one tomato is out of, um, out of sorts, not where you want it to be. So before you snap away and then later say, oh, I wish I would have done whatever to this image, slow down, take a second, compose it in your um, frame, in your rectangle, find your focus, find your exposure. And before you take an image, stop and think, does that look right? And if it does, take the image. If it needs a little tweaking, then go ahead and tweak it, right? Move it out of the way, take a shot look at it, reframe. The beauty of digital photography is that it doesn't cost anything. Once you get the phone, I mean, you can take, I think I have like 30,000 pictures on my phone. I might need to clear that out. But, you know, back in the day when I first started, I had disposable cameras when I was in middle school, you know, so I had like 24 pictures. Or I, when I would shoot black and white, I would have, okay, these are the 24 pictures I have. And it was, you really kind of slowed down to make sure you were taking a good photo. And it's so easy with digital photography to just rapid fire. You know, you shoot a hundred pictures of something and they're not that good, slow down and get a good photo the first time. I mean, of course, when you're learning, take all the, um, take all the things that you can, but the more you do, just slow down and let it, um, you know, let it uh, kind of decide for you what the better photo is. So chasing the light. Um, again, photography is all about light. The basics of photography is capturing light. So I just want to spend a little bit of time kind of talking to you about light and how you chase that light. Um, again, this is on my, you know, table in my barn. So light is the fundamental element that all photographs need because it illuminates a scene or the subject. There's natural light, artificial light, and there's also quality and direction of light. So just a real, this is such a great example of just kind of understanding light. Um, you know, time of day matters, how the light falls on your subject. Um, you can practice this by finding a lamp in your house and kind of moving it around your subject to see how that light changes. I mean, you can take semester long courses on light and how to control light. And I just think this is a good example. It's like light from the side, light from above, light from below. So if you can kind of learn how this light works, or if you find that spot in your barn that has really good light, that's where you should take all your photos. Not all of them, but you know what I mean. So even with the advancement in technology, a camera is still seen as essentially just a box with a hole in it. Um, I'm sorry, I have to, uh, it'll just be one second. I have it, uh, my daughter needs me. Oh, come on. It's okay. It's okay. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> I can hear my daughter in the other room telling me she needed to pee. So I got her, got her taken care of. I'm so glad this is being recorded. Um, let's try this again. Um, so even with all the advancements in technology, um, a camera can still be seen as essentially just a box with a hole in it and one end lets light in. I mean, that's back in the early stages of photography, it literally was a pinhole in a box that let light in. So you still need the mechanics and the means to record a photo at its simplest, but really the basic elements of an image haven't changed over 200 years. You're just trying to get light in whatever box you might have. So light helps you create a mood and can bring an emphasis to elements within your composition. Um, also light can help create depth. It can accentuate texture, create a mixture of shadows and highlights. Um, and I'm gonna kind of show you like what time of day is better light or just kind of how to harness that light to your advantage. 
So light will change throughout the day. Um, watch the same places and kind of see how it changes, right? So if you always take a picture of your barn, does it look better in the morning? Does it look better um, in the evening? Um, if it's just light through a window, just how does that change? And I know for me, there are certain times I like to take pictures more than others. Um, and you'll kind of learn that with your own property, right? Like, oh, it looks so much better this time of day. So kind of just keep track of your farm or your market um, and see when you think those pictures might be better. So time of day matters. Here's a great example. If you look at the picture on the left, it's like even light, not a lot of shadows versus the image on the top right is um, more like high noon. You can see those really harsh shadows versus warmer golden hour light into dusk. And always one of my favorite examples is the Grand Canyon. I used to have this um, folding postcard on my office when I was a high school teacher and it was someone set up a camera and they took a picture of the Grand Canyon every hour for 24 hours and it was every single picture was so different. So I encourage you to watch your farm, watch your greenhouses, um, watch your fields and say, gosh, you know what, my fields look the best early, early in the morning. Well then go out there and take those photos at that time. So again, time of day has a huge effect on quality, saturation, also the amount of light coming in. Always be conscious of shadows and use those to your advantage. Sometimes you have to shoot with shadows. It happens. So if you have shadows, think about how it benefits your image. Um, you can create different moods of the same scene by photographing the subject at different times of the day. So the picture on the right is my farm many years ago. Gosh, it looks way different now, but um, you can see the difference of later with shadows along the carrot rows versus the morning when you got that nice fog. So same place, different time of day. Um, nice golden light up at the top, my friends getting married, versus a cool morning light can really change the dynamic of an image. Overcast light is ideal. Like you always hear brides want to get married on like a beautiful sunny day. And yeah, sure, it's beautiful. The sky is blue, but a sunny, sunny day can cause shadows. Overcast light is really the best in terms of even light. Right, so you think about high noon, the sun is right overhead, and that's when the shadows are kind of the harshest. But if you can shoot on an overcast day, um, you're going to have that nice even light and it's not as harsh on your subject. That being said, the picture on the right of the asparagus, that's the same, those were taken a few minutes apart. And all I did was kind of stand the basket up and I just diffused that harsh light. So you're not shooting in the barn, why not create that kind of um, lighting option? So. The picture on the bottom with that kind of, I mean, yeah, that light is warm and I like it, but the picture on the top, I just kind of lifted that basket up and arranged it to where the light was more filtered. And the same thing with the picture on the left with the berries, that shot at a very bright time of the day. I just, again, picked up my basket and kind of created this um, shade, if you will, to diffuse the light a little bit. So the pictures here would be an example of high noon right? Um, really harsh shadows. It kind of is distracting to the image, right? So you can see one area is really bright, one area is really dark. This would be better if we could shoot at, you know, four or five o'clock, but maybe you're at a farm and you don't have four or five o'clock. So think about you can hold up something to kind of diffuse the light. You can take those flowers and move them into the barn if that helps diffuse the light. But it, the shadows can work in your advantage or they can be distracting. And that's kind of your role um, as the photographer is, do these help me or are they taking away from my image? So here's a nice example of an overcast day. Um, you know, it's just nice and even, right? There's no like real bright or real dark. It's just nice and even. Overcast light is also ideal for portraits. So you can see in this image, um, you know, this is the time of day I was there. This is the picture I had to take. Sometimes that's just the way it is, but you can see kind of harsh shadows on his face and just real shadowy kind of all around. Um, you can always have your subjects lift their hats up a little bit if that can help. But, you know, if you can, try not to shoot in the middle of the day, the, the harshest part of the day. So here's an example of overcast light, this gentleman with his sorghum out in the field. Even though he's wearing a hat, it's nice and even, right? It's like diffused. Um, so again, if you can shoot on that kind of day, it, you'll really be able to tell the difference. And at market, everybody's standing under a tent, right? So think of that tent as like a diffuser that you would have in a studio. If you feel like it's really harsh, like you're standing outside 
and you're shooting people inside the tent, you're in a different lighting source than they might be. So get them to the back of their tent and you also get under the tent and that will help you be on the same light level as they are. I know with COVID it's hard, you know, with social distancing and stuff, but you have this nice diffuser set up right there in the tent and it can really help you on those um, sunny days. And when you can shoot in the golden hour, everyone and everything looks great in golden warm light. This is over at Lady Luck Flower Farm. And I would say, okay, I'm going to come shoot you guys, but I don't want to come over until like six o'clock, right? So golden hour is the hour before the sun sets and it's the hour right after the sun comes up in the morning. And think about when does your yard look the best, right? Think about, you know, you're sitting on the back deck, your day's over, having a glass of wine, everything just looks really gold and warm and pretty. That's when you should go take photos because everything just looks better warmer even tomatoes right you got that nice warm light in the morning sometimes it'll be more like yellows and pinks and the evening it'll be more like oranges and yellows and reds oh so beautiful here's a good example of the golden hour you can see the sun is almost setting and everything is just nice and warm um, if you're stuck inside um, window light is awesome for taking photos um you know i used to when i'll go take pictures of my friends kids i'd be like okay let's go stand by the window it's just diffused and soft think about those old renaissance paintings right the flowers are probably lit by a window so shooting indoors of course can limit your amount of natural light so one thing that you can do is you can always um increase the light if you need to by getting closer to the window you can position your subject by a window to give them just enough light for the image. Um, I encourage you to kind of look at your own house and see what windows um, would work if you have a big sliding glass door. That's a good option. You think that's a huge piece of light coming in. Um, it's a great place to shoot still lifes or, you know, children. Here's some examples of, you know, using that window light. The one on the left is just so beautiful. Again, it looks like that kind of old Renaissance painting. It's just that nice diffused light coming in shadows to your advantage. And I'm gonna spend the rest of this time just kind of talking about some compositional techniques. So, so far we've kind of gone over, um, you know, how to use your camera a little bit better, thinking about your focus, thinking about your exposure, um, thinking about the setting, think about what editing you can do within your own camera. Um, but at the end of the day, your viewers aren't gonna see that. Your viewers are gonna see how you kind of organize this rectangle. Okay, so I'm just going to show you some tricks of how to um, organize your rectangle to be more visually stimulating. Here's a good picture of HDR, like we were talking about earlier, high dynamic range. The sky is in focus, or I should say the sky is exposed, and the greenhouses are exposed, and the flowers are exposed. So I was able to put it on HDR and tell my camera, no, I want everything exposed. And again, some of these things might seem really basic, like obvious, but I'm gonna, you know, just kind of put it all out there. So composition, again, is one of the most important elements of photography, because in the end, that's what your viewer is gonna see. And we're gonna talk about um, a few techniques here. So basic camera techniques, again, this is if you had, say, a SLR or a camera that had a few more functions, but these concepts are in your phone too. So by changing the aperture, which is the the aperture is the device inside your camera that kind of opens and closes and lets light in, either lets a lot of light or a little bit of light in. And that aperture also controls depth of field or what is in focus in your frame. So a shallow depth of field emphasizes a specific element in the photograph, like this flower, right? When we think of flower photos, we typically think of this kind of style where it's like a flower and the background is kind of blurred out um, versus a deep depth of field, which will show the entire scene and create a sense of distance. Your camera is going to default on that deep depth of field, unless you have it on that portrait mode, right? So if you want that shallow depth of field, think about that portrait mode on your camera. So here's a deep depth of field, right? Everything's in focus. Our carrots are in focus all the way to the barn, all the way to the mountain in the background. If this was a shallow depth of field, maybe I would get on the ground and just shoot the carrots up close. If you have a distance in your photo, like this photo here where the mountain is far away, it's easy to get a deep depth of field because there is a long distance between you and the subject matter. A shallow depth of field is going to be easier to obtain if you are closer to your subject matter, like that flower, right? I'm physically closer to it. Some of you might have a macro setting on your camera, which usually is a symbol of a little flower, right? Um, the deep depth of field would be a symbol of a mountain, so pretty basic, right? So if you have that symbol of a flower, practice that with your phone 
you're going to have to get close to your subject in order for that function to work properly. So like this picture here of the flowers, um, of course, I'm closer to that than I am, say, to the farmer at the bottom. Right. So if you're physically closer, you're able to get that shallower depth of field. And you really just have to ask yourself, what do I want to what do I want to showcase in this picture? Right. So here I am. I'm photographing a farm to table dinner. I want to show the whole table. I'm going to do a deep depth of field. I just want to show a detail of a cool plate. Maybe I'll get closer. Maybe I'll use my portrait mode and I'll blur out everything but um, the plate. If that makes sense. So really just think about what do I want my picture to showcase? You can control shutter speed to capture action and photos of kids and animals often need a faster shutter speed. Now on your camera phone, you might say, well, how do I control shutter speed? You know, on an SLR, you can change, you know, it's fast shutter speed or slow shutter speed and you can kind of help it that way. Most of your phones are going to have an option for like rapid fire, right? You can tap it a bunch or you can hold your finger down and it might take, you know, like when my daughter takes pictures, she'll hold the camera button down and she'll take 20 pictures at once. Well, Maybe 18 of those are blurry, but one of those is really good. So delete the others and save the one that's sharp, right? So the picture on the left here, Wendy over at Dry Ridge, she's pouring out grain. It's a fast shutter speed because that grain is kind of caught in motion. And same with the little baby there walking. You need a fast shutter speed to kind of capture those. If you feel like you're not fast enough at hitting that button, don't be afraid to hold that button down and take a bunch of photos. Again, it doesn't cost you any money. It's not like you're wasting film. Just delete them later. Save the one that's the sharpest or the most in focus. Um, one thing that can really help your photography is shooting at eye level. So no matter who or what your subject matter is, if your subject on the ground, you should be on the ground too, right? No one likes to look like they have a bigger nose than they already do. Um, so you don't want to be below something and shooting up, especially with people, right? You don't want to be down below shooting up. You also don't want to be looking down on your subject matter. It just, it's not that it's like a sign of disrespect, but it just feels like you're looking down on something and it just kind of changes the angle and kind of the feeling of the image versus getting lower and getting at eye level, whether the eye is of a pig or a goat or, you know, a little kid, whatever. It just makes your image look like you slowed down and took the time to compose it. So here's some more examples um, our pet parade at West Asheville. Um, I was able to use some of Quinn's photos uh, from market. Thank you, Quinn. Um, but getting down versus like you taking a picture, just shooting down at this little baby. Um, I just think this picture is great. Take the time, slow down. How can I make this better? Right. And, you know, I say eye level. I mean, those are flower bulbs. Eye level to them is still being equal to where they are. It just makes your image a little more dynamic. So no matter what it is, baby chicks or kale, think about getting lower. I mean, no one sees you taking the photo. They just see the end result. So even if you feel like you look kind of silly, who cares? Try it. You might be surprised. Here's another good example. Eye level with bread, right? <laughs> Instead of looking down or up from it. And, you know, kids, of course, too, you know, get on their level. It really adds to it. The other option, if you don't want to shoot at eye level, is the concept of worm's eye versus bird's eye, right? So you're a little tiny worm in the ground, and you got a little camera, and you're looking up at something. You know, I'd say I often shoot at eye level, but you can totally shoot below or above. Um, and then bird's eye would be, you know, if you're a bird and you're flying with the camera over your subject, right? So think about how, um, how can I benefit, how can my image benefit from my position, right? It doesn't cost any money to move around, walk around, lift your camera up, lift your camera down, lay on the ground, you know, whatever. Just think about how you can photograph um, your subject and what angle you're shooting from. So here's some other um, examples. I love the pictures on the left because the picture on the top left with the apples is like, yeah, boom, there's my picture. I'm going to leave versus the picture on the bottom where you slow down, compose it a little bit, get a little bit closer, you know, tap my focus and make sure that ASAP sticker is nice and sharp. Right. So think about, um, again, it doesn't cost any money. So why not shoot a couple different options? Oh, morel season. Delicious. Um, so here I am shooting just them laying on a table versus me out in the woods looking for them. And it got, you know, kind of down below and shot up a little bit at that mushroom. So we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, varying your shots again i was saying you know go eye level above below try different things but you can also change 
kind of how you photograph the scene in terms of your lens choice. If you're using a um, SLR camera, you know, you can take off the lenses and you can put on a wide angle lens or you can put on a telephoto lens that can zoom for you or a close up lens. If you're shooting with your phone, you just have the one lens, right? But you can zoom out or you can zoom in or you can step back or you can step closer. Right. So think about how you can approach your subject matter. Um, my background is in journalism. I worked for a newspaper for a long time. And if I showed up at a, I don't know, a, a speaker, right, at an event, and I took all my pictures in the back corner of the um, auditorium, and I turned in 100 pictures of the same angle to my editor, I probably wouldn't have a job for very long. Right. So I would always shoot wide shots, medium shots, close up shots. And this was when I shot film, right? So I had to shoot, you know, everything I could, but within 24 or 36 um, shots, give the options, right? If you look at someone's Instagram, they're not all close-ups and they're not all wide shots, right? You, the viewer wants to see variation. If you think about it, you pick up a National Geographic magazine or a local food guide, you might have pictures of a farm, you have a picture of a field, and then you got a picture of these peaches, and then you got a picture of a person, and then you got a picture of a detail shot. The viewer, your eye wants that, um, the differences in that way, and it helps you kind of engage your viewer a little bit more. So the difference in between those, and we'll look at a couple examples, um, your wide so shot kind of sets the scene, it captures multiple elements of the subject matter, and you use your widest lens setting or zoomed all the way out. Your medium shot kind of takes you there. If we were using our SLRs, we'd have a 50 millimeter lens, um, but that's kind of your medium focal length. And then your close-up is gonna show a detail of that subject. So you can zoom in if you have that little flower setting, if you've got the portrait mode on your camera, you can isolate that one thing, but think about how you can shoot those details. So it's always good to give yourself you know, practice, but say, okay, I'm gonna shoot my farm. I'm gonna tell my farm story in three photos. How would you do that? What would be your wide shot? What would be your medium? And what would be your close-up, right? So let's look at some examples. Here's your wide, your wide sets the scene. Okay, here is a field of greens. We know that this is a field of greens. We can see a fence. We can see the woods. And then our medium shot takes us there, right? So here's the farmer. He's talking about it. Here he is with um, a handful of greens. And then our close-ups show us the details so it shows us that he bites his nails but it also shows us kind of that real you know the curly part of the green or the inside of that cabbage so wide medium close up so here's an apple orchard that i visited the one on the top left it shows me hey this is an apple orchard here's apples you can see behind this is a pretty big orchard there's rows and rows and rows of them and the medium kind of says oh here's some apples in a tree and then the close-up is that nice detail of a hand holding an apple or a nice apple sliced open so i would say your homework should be how do you photograph your farm or your market in those three photos so here's another example of um, my sorghum farmer here he is um, working with the cane the wide shot shows his field it shows the truck the medium shot shows him putting it through the processor, and that close-up is the cane and the finished product. Got that shallow depth of field, right? You could do that close-up um, with the little flower icon. You could use the portrait setting. But these four pictures really tell a very complete story, right? I could take these pictures and put them in a magazine, and they'd be ready to go with an article, right? So four photos, three photos can really tell you the story. Um, here's a picture of my friend, um, the Asheville Bee Charmer. So here she is working in her hives. Here she is checking on one. And then we have that nice detail um, of bees at work. It just kind of feels complete, right? If you were looking at a magazine and it was just close-up pictures of bees or just 20 pictures of her holding up um, a little flat of wax, it would be like, okay. But, you're, you know, when you have all these different um, focal lengths or different settings, it really just kind of feels like a complete story. And here's one more um, hives at our farm, um, checking the hives, close up of the bees, and then a little square of yum yums. And this seems really simple. I always I always say this because um, a professor of mine in grad school said the cheapest thing you can ever do with your camera is remembering that you can turn it sideways. So when we take pictures, we always I mean, I do. I put it up and I just take it horizontally, right? So it's so simple, but why not see if that picture looks more dynamic if it was shot vertically, right? So if you went to the National Monument in DC and you 
you would take a picture of it vertically. Well, what if you took a picture of it horizontally, right? Why not try and see if it looked different? So here are um, carrots in the barn. And this is the same group of carrots, but sh shot horizontally. So again, doesn't cost any money. Why not try both ways? So it's like, what is important in your scene? Does a vertical orientation help it? Um, I like the picture on the left. This is a farmer that invented the Mountain Magic tomato, which is so good. It's like pretty blight resistant. It's one of the tomatoes we grew out in the field. I like both images. You know, I would turn both these images in if I was working for a magazine. But the vertical shot to me works better here because it kind of shows his area, his surroundings, the cup, his tools, all those things. It's not like one is better than the other. It's really personal choice, but why not shoot both? Um, our local food guide and really all magazine covers are typically a vertical shot. So I really like the picture on the right, but the picture on the left worked for the cover because it's vertical, right? So again, why not shoot both? One might work better uh, than the other. Um, rule of thirds is one of the kind of basic compositional tools in photography. It's like the grid lines that I was telling you about on your camera settings. You know, you break it up into vertical thirds and horizontal thirds and kind of where those lines intersect are known as sweet spots. You want to just think about how can you arrange your um, images or I should say the subject matter of your images within those thirds. Um, you know, you never organize things in twos right martha stewart would say hang three pictures or five pictures it's kind of the same idea it's kind of creating balance by being um uneven if you will so here the picture um the smiling lady um she's on that right thirds of the image and the table is kind of at the bottom thirds you could even say the nourish and flourish is on that left thirds Here's another example of my cousin picking apples. Um, she's in the right thirds and that apple is almost right in that sweet spot, right? So if you shoot with your grid lines turned on on your camera, um, it kind of can help you practice um, using those rule of thirds. By no means do you need to shoot with rule of thirds every time. It's called rule the rule of thirds, but you know, it's just another uh, technique to use. So here's our farmer again. He's on that left thirds and the greens are kind of on the bottom thirds. And that open space where he's looking or leading room is in the other two thirds, right? So it just kind of feels balanced. You can always center, I mean, by all means, center your subject matter, but this is just another way to kind of mix up your composition. And then again, they're walking in the right thirds, the apples in the left thirds, and it kind of just has that feeling of completion. Leading lines, um, you know, really easy to do as farmers because we have these rows that kind of go off. Um, leading lines lead the viewer into the photo. So compose your shot using these available lines and shapes. If you see these, think, how can I use these in my, um, in my image? So this is a strawberry farm I visited down in South Carolina. And your eye, I mean, as the viewer, I mean, don't you just go right down? You're just like, you want to walk down those fields. And it's just a really basic technique that you can um, do. Um, so same here, looking down the rows of jam. You can kind of see how it um, blurs out. And hi, Josephine. It's over. it's over. Okay. Do you want to go down to the barn and see daddy? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And the picture on the sorry guys, the picture on the right is um, carrots leading to the barn. So even though everything's in focus, it kind of just leads us um, right there. Fill the frame with your subject matter. Think about how you can use um, the image to really fill every corner, right? So use available patterns or textures, repetitive elements. I love the picture on the right that um, from West Asheville Market um, from our friend Chris. Every corner has something going on, right? You've got, um, even if it's just fabric, you know, it just really feels like a complete image when all your corners have something going on. Another great example of filling the frame. Um, the picture on the right, the frame is filled. Um, we just have equal amounts of wood kind of along the bottom, the right, the top. So if you're going to do that, just really make sure it looks kind of balanced. Um, even the picture with the eggs missing, it still feels balanced in that it's kind of equal um, spacing all around. Uh, picture, I love this picture on the left. You know, sometimes it just takes laying down a napkin, right, to um, give you some sort of background. A picture of the, I believe these are macaroons on the right. Um, you know, think about filling that frame and using the elements that you have. 
Again, every corner matters. I look at this picture on the left and I always see that little blue line at the top corner. You know, I put my thumb over that. I'm sure I could Photoshop it, right? But why not just move your camera a little bit or put a tomato in the back corner? It'll just feel nice and complete if every, you know, if the frame is really filled. Um, oftentimes a busy background can really kill a photo. Um, you know, I look at the picture on the left and there's just so much going on. There's like a tobacco basket and a broken door and, you know, my messy barn. Um, so I just picked up the door and kind of made, you know, a little studio setting, if you will. Um, oftentimes a busy background can, you kind of lose um, focus on what the subject matter is. This is when, say, using the portrait mode could come in handy again. Say I didn't, wasn't able to blur out the background with the, or move the background with that door. Maybe I would set it on the portrait mode and just focus on the flowers and let the background blur out. <laughs> I love this picture. Um, you know, at farmer's markets, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of people. There's all this stuff going on. Um, this picture is great, but I just see that lady's legs, right? So take time to maybe turn and... You can wait until that person passes, or you can use the portrait mode and really blur out the background. Anything that's kind of distracting, just get it out of there. So here's a good example of our booth, right? So you can see our banner's not hung up very well. Um, there's stuff in the background. And it's a good photo, but the photo on the right is better, right? So if you can kind of, you know, pull it in and focus on one aspect of the photo it just seems less busy if that makes sense you can also shoot at a different angle so instead of shooting straight on why not shoot from the side and that would eliminate some of the busy background and also getting an eye level right even though this is jars of jam like getting at eye level um you know kind of even though there's a van in the background things like that um you can kind of limit the amount of things in the image that way so here's another example. Um, looks like an overcast day, but it might just be the lighting from the tent. But instead of, again, shooting straight on and getting the car and all those things, shoot from the side. If you shoot head on, why not zoom in a little bit, fill the frame, and just think about how can, if you look at your picture and you think, all right, this isn't looking good, how can you make it better? This would be how you could make it better, okay? Just um, decluttering, if you will. You, again, you can shoot with that um, portrait mode. So here's an example, both photos are good, but maybe the picture on the right is a little better in that there isn't kind of the background, but the picture on the left also shows that you're at a market. So I think it's successful in that it shows that you're at a market, but it's slightly blurred out and then the foreground is in focus, right? So we know what we're looking at, we know what our main subject is, and then the background is, it's back there, um, but it's not super distracting because it's slightly blurred out, if that makes sense. Um, frame your photo with existing lines and shapes. Um, it's a way to eliminate negative space and give the viewer a sense of completion. There's a basket of chamomile. You know, it's in a basket, which is a nice way to just frame everything and everything just kind of, you know, just feels complete, right? All our corners are taken care of and it just kind of is held in that um, cool design of the basket and then this beautiful chop you know that plate naturally frames it and you can see there's almost e equal corners in all corners right so we've got the chop is our main focus but you know use what you have to kind of frame frame your subject matter this is something that's really useful for farmers is think about using people or available objects to show scale right? It breaks up the shot, but it also gives the image a point of focus, and it lets us know the size of that fruit or vegetable or product. So if you think about um, back to your early science days, right, earth science, they'd have a picture of a rock, and they'd always have that guy like put a shovel next to it or a pick or a ruler. Well, we know the size of a pick or a ruler so we say oh well that's the size of that thing so it's like the picture of the arrowhead that i found that's a pretty sweet arrowhead because it's very large it's a large point compared to that quarter but if you put your thumb over that quarter and you didn't know that the quarter was there that could be a small point it could be a medium-sized point um so by putting something that shows the scale like that fish i caught is one two three almost four beer cans long right um if you didn't have that it could be any size fish but um, that might not be the best example, but you know what I'm saying. So here's another example. Um, if you're a farmer who produces things like this, um, okay, it's a giant collard green. Having a person there 
shows you, gosh, that's a pretty big collard green. Whereas it, it could just be the size of a piece of spinach. Same thing with these blackberries. By having my hand there, you can see those are really big blackberries. Whereas if they were in a basket, you might not be able to tell the size of them. Um, so here is the biggest cabbage and the biggest sunflower I've ever grown. I don't know how that sunflower happened. It actually was a volunteer that showed up this year. Um, that just shows you by me holding it versus maybe taking a picture of it standing by itself you could tell it was big but then when i hold it up against me and you think gosh that's a re that's really big same thing with the cabbage i mean mind you my friend is you know five two but still that's a very big cabbage you might not be able to see the size of that cabbage if you didn't have a human scale um, to compare it to um, and it could be as simple as just your hand right here holding up a um a whole chicken it shows you that's a decent sized chicken and we can see the weight on it too but it's like that's a good sized chicken that's a good sized piece of ginger right by putting your hand underneath you could say oh okay i see that basic you know kindergarten lesson here is thinking about your colors thinking about your color wheel some colors just look better together our brains think that red and green look good together i mean it looks like christmas but red and green are opposite of each other just like blue and yellow just like purple and well, i guess a purple and yellow but just how our eyes see color your viewer or anyone looking at your photos are going to have that same kind of response so in this example you know your primary colors your secondary your complementary um the analogous which i call like cousin colors your yellows orange and reds together if you look at something and you think oh that looks really cool it's because your mind is putting those colors together. The way we see color, we all and we all see those colors in that way. So maybe you take a picture of just green things or just blue and purple things, or maybe you take a picture of purple and yellow together. I mean, look at sports teams or really um, labeling for products. There's a reason we pick the colors that we do because our mind likes those colors together. So, you know, blue and yellow, a blue truck and a yellow quilt square or red um, roots and green tops. Like it just looks good. Our eyes like those colors together. So think about um, here you are photographing at the market. I love this picture of cherries and strawberries. You know, it's a great photo in that it shows a lot of stuff. The image is full. Um, you know, it's got a good angle, kind of lower down, but also those colors just look good together. Same with the picture on the left with the tomatoes. Um, you know, it almost looks like that color wheel, right? Just kind of red going into yellow. Beautiful. And then if you're going to do solid colors, I mean, I always, I'm looking at something and I think, how could this be better? Oh, okay. Uh, these green watermelons in a green wheelbarrow or putting all the yellow tomatoes together. You know, the human eye likes that kind of sense of completion um, and it likes like things together. And one of the best things that you can do is get close. Of course, I was wearing, you know, protective gear when I took this photo, but, um, you know, a famous photographer once said, uh, Robert Kappa, one of the first um, true kind of war photojournalists, um, if your pictures aren't good enough, then you aren't close enough. And I want you guys to think about that. If I, my pictures aren't good enough, then I'm not close enough. Get closer, right? Maybe not with bees if you don't have protective equipment on, but get closer to the picture of carrots. Get closer to the picture of your family goat, right? Get down at eye level. Get your camera on your macro setting or flower setting. Get closer. Zoom in a little bit. Physically closer is often going to be a better quality than zooming closer, if that makes sense. You know, if you zoom in on your camera and it starts to not look as good or you're, maybe you're shaky, um, it's going to look better if you physically get closer, tap on your screen to find that focus, and really, um, you know, think about how, if I got closer, would my picture be better? Um, here's some examples of getting closer. So you could take a picture of people sampling jam from, you know, across the market. Oh, here's people at a booth. Why not get right in that action and take that photo? Same thing with pictures of, you know, meat in a cooler. Um, it's hard to, you know, it's not the easiest thing to photograph meat. I, I get that. But here we have, it's a vertical shot. It is sharp. The frame is filled and we're just getting closer, right? We can see the name, all those things. So again, if you aren't, if your pictures aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. And last but not least, I've said it, and I'll say it again, is shoot away. Keep a, a folder of your favorites. Um, just shoot a bunch. 
save them for later. Maybe you have them, you take a really good photo and you don't post it on Instagram the day of the market. Why not save it for another day when you don't have good photos? Or maybe it's pouring rain at market and you want to take, oh, I wish I had a picture of whatever. You know, why not take a lot of photos? I mean, I have photos stacked on top stacked on top of other photos waiting to be used for my Instagram, right? It's not like you have to take a picture and post it that day. Why not have a photo that you can use later? So like for our garlic planting, I don't have any garlic um, planting images from this year because we haven't planted it yet, but this is a picture I took from a couple years ago, right? Um, in terms of composition, there's a lot of different things going on here. I'm eye level with the garlic. I'm shooting um, kind of leading lines to the farmer. The background's out of focus. My horizon line is straight. Um, I've got scale with the measuring tape. So a lot of different things going on there. In terms of composition, you can put many different elements of composition in your um, in your photo. It's not like you just have to use rule of thirds or you just have to use the portrait mode. Think about all the different things that you can put, the, the tools that you've learned that you can put in these images. Um, so again, um, for me, your homework should be learning your camera. If you don't know everything on your camera, you know, I encourage you to look at YouTube videos and research um, different things for your functions of your camera. Look at how you can edit photos in your camera, right? You don't need expensive apps. A lot of those apps are free, but you don't need, most cameras are gonna have basic editing in your, um, in your camera. You can always edit it a little bit on Instagram, things like that. But like on Facebook, you don't really get to edit it. You kind of just put it up and that's what it is. So edit it in your phone before. Um, and then also think about how can you tell your farm story or your market story in those three images, right? Wide, medium, and close up. How can you tell that story in three pictures? You might like one picture more than the other, but just when you approach something, think, how can I shoot this differently? How can I slow down? How can I um, make this picture not just a quick photo, but like an actual photograph? So again, some examples of saving for later. Maybe take the, I've used this picture on the left. I've been using it literally for years because I love it. Um, but it's just a photo that I saved because I didn't use it right away, but I ended up using it a lot um, down the road. And here are some examples from um, West Asheville. Um, just a great use of using the pictures you have for marketing, right? So you don't have to think, oh, I got to take a picture today. You know, go back through your archives and, you know, the pictures of strawberries is perfect. You know, throw some text over it. Um, I love the picture on the left. It's so cute. Um, but just think about how you, you know, create that catalog. And maybe there's an image that you use a lot. If you like that image, try to recreate that image. Why is it successful? Why do you think that picture was um, the best picture that you took? And I just want to say thank you for coming. This is my beautiful daughter, Josephine, that interrupted my presentation twice. Hopefully that didn't uh, derail me um, too bad. Um, again, here's a great example of scale. Right, that's a really big sunflower and that is a really big beet. Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks. That was so awesome. Um, a lot of the questions that we received leading up to today's um, presentation were covered by you. So I want to take this time to, if you have a couple minutes, Sarah, just to open up the floor sure. to any questions that folks might have while we're here, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and Sarah, if you wouldn't mind clicking to stop the presentation. Of course. Yeah, my husband is here and he's farming and I'm like, can you watch her for one hour? And he's like, you're fine. It'll be fine for one hour. What could go wrong? Well, that yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you handle it with grace. It happens. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Perfect. I covered everything. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, um, feel free to reach out to me if anything comes to mind following this um, workshop. I think you should have my email address. Um, I'm the one who sent the invite to today's meeting, so feel free to contact me moving forward. Um, we'll, as I mentioned earlier, we'll also be putting a copy of this workshop um, on ASAP's website, so you can go back and access it at any time. Oh, um, if you could, un you can feel free to type it in there, um, type in your question in the chat box if that's helpful. Okay. 
see how that works here. Using a black background is the question, should you use a black background or how do you use a black background? Can you hear me, Smoky Mountain? Oh my gosh, I almost made it on time. Yes. <laughs> really close. I didn't have a watch, <laughs> so I didn't know. I always think I And we started it a little late too. Um, so you need to photograph meat. Um I would um I would find a good location with good lighting. Um and I would practice with um you know, get your setup like if you're always kind of photographing um Say you, you're photographing products for a website or um, you want a consistent look, you know, you can set up um, your black backdrop and I would try to limit that backdrop as much as possible. You know, you don't want your whole screen being black. You know, I kind of talked a lot about isolating things and um, making your subject matter kind of on the forefront. So even though you're using a black background, I would still make your um, subject matter kind of the main the main source. And if you can find a place that works well for you, you can always keep that set up. Um, you don't need fancy studio lights. Um, you can use lights, lamps in your house if you want. Um, but if you could shoot that with a black background on an overcast day, that would be ideal. So I hope that helps. All right. Um, well, if there aren't any other questions, we will We'll wrap up for this session. And yeah, please keep an eye out on ASAP's website for a copy of this workshop, as well as the um, handout that will accompany it. Good luck, everybody. Happy photo taking. <laughs>